The 80s Rewind Show Podcast. It's time to bring you yet another amazing episode. And now, welcome your host. The face for Radio Burgess. Enjoy the show. Hello, hello. It's the Show, and I've got a fantastic one for you today. How you doing out there? I hope you're doing extremely well. So, I've got my finger out. I finally got my finger out, and I've got myself a website. So, here's the address. Check out the website, www.the80spod.com. So, for those that missed it, www.the80spod.com. So if you type in 80spod.com, you can find out more about the show and also you can get some of the um, episodes that you've missed that are on there. And there's pictures of me in the 80s um, and then um, there's bits and bobs on there. Have a look, have a look. So I'm going to say have a look. Uh, don't forget, if you want to email me, you can email me at... The 80s Rewind Show at gmail.com. That is... The 80s Rewind Show at gmail.com. Like I said, I paid a tenner for these jingles, so I'm going to use them. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, today's guest, uh, we had a fantastic chat and I've never had such a laugh interviewing anybody as I did today. I've got the fantastic Junior Giscom uh, coming up for you. Um, great guy, absolutely great guy. We had a great time and we spoke about music and we also, um, we raised the point, uh, we talked about the song Too Late, uh, which was the track just after Mama used to say. Um, and the song was inspired by um, violence, uh, home violence. So if you're sensitive to that issue and we start talking about it, um, you might want to skip that bit. Um, if not, um, if you need help, um, we sort of talk about why you should um, in that situation. It was a really, really interesting conversation. Sometimes when you're doing the podcast, you know, you're just talking and then it can take you in a different direction. And uh, me and Junior had that happened we were talking about stuff and then we we got ourselves down an alley and uh, we were talking about how serious it can be and how music can help people and change their lives in a really really positive manner um so i hope you enjoyed this episode uh, we talk about mum used to say we talk about his timing links uh, and we talk about him writing songs for sheena easton um yeah what can I say? It was a fantastic episode. I laughed a lot on this one and I really enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to check out um, the email address, the 80s we want show at gmail.com and www.the80spod.com for the website. And like and subscribe, all the stuff, do the sharing, spread the love, all the usual stuff. And I'll speak to you on the next one. Anyway, Junior Yiscom, let's get to it. Let's go back to the start. When did What sort of music was there in the house? Was there a lot of music when you was growing up? Did you enjoy music? Yeah, there was. There was um, jazz, there was um, pop, there was soul, there was reggae, there was um, everything. We, we would have, um, oh, what was it, Radio Caroline back in the day, and you'd have that going. At the same time, I had two old brothers, and they were staunchly into like reggae music, and my, my sisters, they were into like soul music. My mum was into gospel my dad was into jazz. So music was like coming from everywhere, but I liked all of it. It was like it, you could hear the beauty in everything. Mm. You know, every every part of those different sections of music, there was something about it, you know, like, um, all right, with the jazz, it was like take five, they prove it. No, I loved it, right? And then you get to like the soul thing, the Sam Cooke, I loved it. Right, and then you got the James Brown, loved it, and then the, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And then you got in England at the time, you got your Beatles, loved it. You got your Stones, loved it. You got your Yardbirds, loved it. You got, you know, Winwood Ash from America, loved it. You, it was all coming in. Yeah, it's all coming into the house, and you know, we'd sit down and we'd watch Whispering Bob, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right, the old Great Whistle Test, and. That would come in. Do you get what I'm saying? So it, yeah. music was something that was always around me. It's amazing. And did you, when you started to sort of discover your voice, were you like just singing to the radio? Were you singing to these songs? Was it, you know, you were just, you know. Just singing around the house. My mum, my mum was a soprano. She really could sing. Wow. And she'd sit down and it would just be effortless for her to just sing. And we had a lot of that in the house too. So you, I kind of learned from my mum, if I'm being honest. Yeah. And then different records, you sing along with them and you understand the pattern of the phrasing and, and then you do your own thing to that. Yeah. Right. So you're mixing it, trying to find something that defines you. And that was me for I would say the first twenty odd years of my life. Wow. 
Wow. And where did you, where did you sort of take the plunge and sort of perform in front of somebody? When was that first moment of? Well, the first moment I did that was, um, I was, yeah, I was 19 properly. And, uh, it was a singing competition and I sang, um, an Isley Brothers song, uh, for the love of you. Mm, And, uh, that night I won, I think it was 50 quid, I think I won. <laughs> but I had 50 mates, so you can imagine that 50 quid just went like that. It was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Let's celebrate the victory, yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on, arms round, arms round. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, that would have been the first time. So from that, that minute, is that when you sort of, uh, did you form a band after that? Did you join a band or did you just sort of start singing solo? No, I, I wanted to, I formed my own band um, just around about that time. And uh, they were called Atlantis. And we had a bass player was from um, Shack Attack. Right. And a guitarist, right, uh, Paul, he was with Modern Romance. So wow. the band was very, we were just a mixture of collective of guys that just love music. Nice. But we didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. So we wanted to come more from um, a Sly Stone kind of back with the Isley Brothers mixed in. So there was that rock element that was like true to the UK. Yeah. But mixed in with what we what we were feeling was soul. Yeah, nice. And we, we, I did that for a few years until I was what, 23. And then I got asked to make an album for a friend of mine. And um, he had two songs, Get Up and Dance, Hot Up and Heat It. Mm. And these two tracks, in the end, um, that, that was the title of the songs in the end, but the backing tracks I really liked. And there was one of them, like, get up, everybody get up and dance. And I had my niece and nephew around. Mm. And I was playing this record over and over and over, you know, just trying to get some idea of what to sing. And these kids were running around the house and they were, everybody get up and dance. And they're running around the house singing this thing. And I thought like, yeah, that sounds all right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So I wrote the song off of the basis of those two kids and went out to France, unbeknown to me, became a number one in their dance charts. And um, the following year when I did Mummy used to say, I had to go to France to uh, perform. and um, I got on stage and I started doing what I used to say and everybody started booing and I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> what's going on here? Right? And then I started shouting out, get up and dance, get up and dance. I was like, you're having a laugh. What? <laughs> <laughs> DJ luckily had the track and I could do like a PA to it. Monster. And then Mama played afterwards and it went down great as well. But it was just that whole thing of your you're moving all the time and, and doing different things yeah. in that young period. And you're not looking at it and saying, right, what happened to that? What? You just get on to the next one and the next one and the next one, you know? And then, as I said, after that, mama came and uh, that was the beginning really. Did you, um, mama in the industry properly. did you ever give your um, niece and nephew some money for the royalties for that? Did you ever? <laughs> no, because you see, both of them have gone on to do very well for themselves. <laughs> I thought they might be, uh, excuse me, Uncle. <laughs> uh, you know that tune that you do over there. <laughs> so, so were you doing, um, with your first band there, were you doing the pub circuit as well? Were you doing a lot of like yeah. gigging and, and did you enjoy that period of the, of being in a band? That was one of the best times. Was it? You, um, yeah, because we, we, we used to play Ronnie Scott's upstairs in Ronnie Scott's as well. Wow. And you'd be, you would, um, there wasn't many people that would come. And if they did come, it was because of the music. And, and we wanted to be different, as I said. Yeah. So we play in one guy in a pub. I'll never forget <laughs> it. One guy. <laughs> Well, I used to, um, I used to play. <laughs> no, it was classic. We were, well, I must've been about 20 then. And it was in Birmingham and there was this one guy in a pub and we were playing and we've got a 45 minute set to play. And this guy sat there for 45 minutes and never turned around. One guy in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
you look back at stuff like that, you can so laugh, and it was such fun. It's you true. Know, you go to, you, you're doing universities, you know, and people are completely fine and stuff like this, and <laughs> the energy that you can bring, and it was mad. <laughs> but it was such a great learning curve, you know? It is. Great for all of us, really. Do you think, um, I mean, I, I used to play in a band myself back in the day and I had the same, we, we got a gig playing, we were a pop band and we played for the Hells Angels in this big tent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as soon as we walked in, it was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we got about four bars in and this place emptied and like yourself, all there was was this guy selling belt buckles sitting there just <laughs> clapping on his own. <laughs> It was amazing. People don't believe you when you tell these kinds of stories. You know what I mean? Because they're like, nah, that can't be true. But honestly, you know, it really does happen. I think as a, as a musician, you have to experience it as well, don't you? You have to have those terrible yeah. gigs. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. if, if you don't, then it doesn't give you that impetus, if you like, to like, I'm going to go out there and smash it tonight, you know? Yeah. You've got to have gone through that whole thing of the learning, understanding it, seeing it for what it is, enjoying it yeah. right, more than anything else and bringing people along with you. Yeah, hundred percent. And do you think that's what's missing in music today? There's people that, you know, people don't have that, that they just go from YouTube to record deals without any experience like that. Yeah. I think sometimes that is the case. But again, times have changed yeah. and the way that we are now communicating is completely different. The way that we are doing social media things is completely different now. I think we need to get back to live. Yeah. Because life is human, you know, and uh, that human aspect of, of, of what we do could get lost yeah. in, in the technology, right? And I, I think it's more about getting back to live bands on stage. Yes, like what you're saying, learning your craft, right? Going out there and playing to people. And smashing it, you know, and understanding right, what you did and making it better and growing. Yeah. So that when you do break, you're a monster man. I said, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Because you've done your homework, you've done that groundwork. Yeah. A lot of bands can just come along and they're there. And they're there for such a short space of time because they didn't do any homework. Yeah. They just graduated, you know. Didn't need to. It was all right. Just went down the path and it was that <laughs> one and I turned it and there you go. I'm there. Gosh. You, you know, oh, you, you mean, get yeah. some who are like that. But overall, if you're going to stick in the business, you have to play yeah. live. I'm also I'm also waiting for an album to come out that's completely done in the old fashioned where vocals are done in one take with backing singers. <sighs> and I, I want an album like that to come out, you know, just yeah. in a room, playing together, bleed all over the microphones. You know, I really want those those albums to start coming back. When I, when I, when I, the first album I did, we had three weeks to make the album, right? Mm. And we went in and we, we 24 seven basically stayed in, lived in, but the band would come in and we'd be just record the band. Yeah. Right. And then we do right. Okay. We see what that is. And then I'd go in and we'd record it all together. So you get that movement and, and, because they're following you and you're following them and there's slight movements in that go on. When you're doing it to the technology, there's no movement. Yeah. There's no movement. It's just what it is. Yeah, it's, that's it's time contracts. frame and that's the, yeah. So there's no you don't feel anything. It's just bland. Yeah. Because it's it doesn't move, it doesn't take you, but the the, the singer is not able to take the band anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And the singer is supposed to be the leader of it. And what's happened in music is now the backing track has become the leader of it, the voice being secondary to it. That's true. So yeah. It's not movement. Yeah. Just things like that. So you've got to play live to understand if you need to make a record that you can go in there and you can do it because you've been out on the road practicing it all that time. Yeah. I'm saying so it's not yeah. a matter of we know we need to sing and might change up and you need to change as well slightly. You can't do that in, in today's music in the same way and get that sound. It's it's interesting. I'm not they're not my sort of thing, but if you said to me like Robbie, you got unlimited money, you, you who right. would you do that that sort of album with? I would pick uh, Christina Aguilera 
Yeah, yeah. I think she's got an amazing great. soul voice that, that that hasn't been discovered yet. Yeah, you know I mean, great I, voice, it, great voice. And I think I think it's sitting there, and no one's going. You need to make a soul <laughs> album, Christina. You know what I mean, like, I think if they did a live like studio, like you know, like we're saying, all in one go, recording yeah. live, her singing, I think that would be absolutely amazing. I think oh, she'd, be, she'd be. You know who else for me? Um, if in turn, because of listening to their records back in the day, I would say Lady Day. I would say Billie Holiday. That kind yeah. of yeah. Sound recording. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it, that, that, that's where my ears. Would be. Yeah, it's got to sound a bit smoky. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the album's got to sound smoky at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and then because of like my mum and what she, my mum was into Mahalia Jackson. Wow. Yeah. You had this pure, hard, very passionate voice, right, coming at you, right. You know, from a very gospel perspective, loved it. Amazing. And then. You know, you, you sit and you say, like, then you listen to, let's say, the early Beatles, the 60s Beatles, mm. Love, Love Me Do and stuff like that, right? And you listen to the sound of what they were creating and the energy, right? Bands today don't get that. I think the Foo Fighters are about the only band <laughs> out there at the minute. That's right, yeah. <laughs> that still has that fire. Yeah. You get what I'm saying in that way? It records analogue, doesn't he, a lot on tape. So he's still got that... Dave Grohl's keeping it alive. <laughs> keeping it alive. It's keeping it alive. Keep music live. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're in your band, um, and then yeah. you you did a single by yourself. When did you get involved with Links? When did that come around? That came around just before Mama used to say um, they had done your line, and the publishing company, a small company at the time, also wanted to sign me. Right. So in- me going up to meet them, I met Dave and Sketch. And uh, they were telling me about your line and it was going to come out and they're going to put a band together. Would I be a part of the band? Wow. And at that time, it was like I just signed with um, Funagram at that time, Mercury. And there wasn't anything really going on other than trying to make the record and then dealing with the promotion and the marketing. Mm. So going out on tour was a great way of keeping some money flow coming yeah. in. Right, and being part of this band that I didn't realise would be as big as it ended up being, you know. And um, we, we, what was that, two years stunt with them? That was fantastic, though. Mm. We went out on tour. We did the whole of the UK. We were the biggest band in the UK at the time. You know, um, we did two nights at the, um, well, a matinee and a night did at two a day at the Dominion. It was that was like the beginning of seeing what it could be like, mm. if you get what I'm saying, in terms of putting music out there and having people come to see your shows and stuff like that. Yeah. We sold out everywhere, you know, and, and it was it was an amazing two years. Yeah. To be and were amazing you two years. And were you were you songwriting at this point or were you sort of just, just getting into songwriting or did you I know you just um you done your previous single Get Up and Dance, but were you a confident writer at this point or were you kind of you know what I mean? Was it were you fully confident you could write a hit song or were you kind of just finding your feet still? I think I was more finding my feet. I um was writing from before, but that was like learning how to write and not writing just um I didn't want to write love songs. I was adamant. I didn't want to write love songs. Right. I wanted to write songs that were more social, more about what we were doing or what we were thinking or how we, and that, that, that was like the mindset when I was in my early twenties coming along. And then it started to open up and I wanted to understand more about the, the technical side of everything. Yeah. So that, because I could see the change. So I wanted to understand. It was like, to be honest, structures of songs was what it was for me. Right. How people would structure songs. I'd listen to um, loads of um, movie scores and, you know, how did you do that watching that film and have that passion and that feeling for that movement and you could make that into such a dramatic piece. Yeah. I wanted to... I was always like that, trying to find my way through. Yeah. And then when I got to, um, I would say, past mommy used to say, I would say, oh, past, do you really want my love? I did a song called Morning Will Come. Mm-hmm. 
And that song was like, you can now write. Yeah. And that was like maybe 10, 12 years, maybe after mummy used to say, wow. you know, before I was confident that like, you can write, you can write something that will make people move. You can write something that can make people dance. You can. But it took into my thirties before I, I kind of had that confidence within myself. Wow. So you're, 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 in your, you're in your thirties. It took, so it took you quite a while to get. That wow. confident. Yeah. Wow. I, I write songs for other people, you know, um, Billy Simon, um, oh, Moody Turner, um, Maxi Priest. It, 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 I've written for, but I never felt 100% confident right. about it. It was like, I know their work, right? They're good songs. I know their work. And when you hear the people on it, you're like, yeah, brilliant. You know? Yeah. But I didn't think that I was that good. I didn't think that I could continue to do that as a career. Yeah. Right. Not do anything else but music. <laughs> Right, you know, I never thought that it was going to be like this. Yeah, I just, you know, you're learning your craft, and you're, you're you. I'm now confident enough that I can write something. I can sit down and I can put my head there, and it's done. I'm that confident now. That's great. That's, if you caught me in my mid thirties, no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Mama used to say, "Comes out, it's a huge smash." And, you know, only a few years before, in 79, you had that huge Disco Sucks movement going on, didn't you? That was just awful. Um, so was, was that a concern, releasing a single that was semi-disco at the time? Was that something that worried you? Or No. I, I, I When we did the mix of Mama Used to Say, it was very ambient. We did it in England, Nick. Very ambient, very open, you know, clashing sound. Just like what you were talking about, things overhead, like, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. To my ears. But the record company couldn't hear it. Right. It was like, oh, it's too open, it's too rock and roll, it's too this, and it, it needs to be more, if you like, condensed, deadened. So um, the A&R man knew somebody in America and said they're going to do a remix. And I'm like, at the time, they, nobody did remixes. Right. What was a remix? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's get all with this right. This is what the times were. Um, what was a remix? What did that mean? <laughs> so it was like, well, you know, they take your masters and they remix the master. Yeah. So I said, all right, fine. So it was sent over to a guy called T. Scott, who at the time was a DJ at the Paradise Garage. Right. And he got asked by a DJ on the radio to come and play for an hour on his show. And that was on a station called WBLS. Right. He, his mix of Mama, he put into the one-hour mix. And the next day, Mama used to say it was on every station in New York. It took a week for it to be on every station, R&B, in the whole of America. Wow. Because the guy who played it through the show, his show is um, Frankie Crocker, his name was. And Frankie was the biggest DJ in America. Wow. Right? So if Frankie played it, you played it. Right. And that's what happened with Mummy used to say. Mummy used to say, but no promotion. It had no marketing <laughs> in America. They spent no money <laughs> on that record in America. Crazy. It just blew up and went to number one, cash board number two on Billboard. And, and not, again, you're learning your craft. I could not get it into my mind in, right, at that time, but it spent no money. Yeah. The record itself was doing this. They hadn't seen me. So it wasn't like they'd seen a look or anything. Yeah. It was the record that was doing this. It's crazy. And that was hard to kind of comprehend. Somebody's ringing you up and saying to you, right, I'm, here, Robbie, you sold 100,000 in Chicago, 225,000 <laughs> in Mississippi, 1,000, 1, but... 1,000, no, sorry, 100,000. <laughs> and they're all cities. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, you know, the figures are outrageous in terms of how much you're selling in these cities. 
which you're not doing. <laughs> yes, you know. to do. <laughs> <laughs> Mad. So it was very difficult. It, it's just showing you it was, it was a, it was in trust, like kind of like journey because you, you're you're trying to comprehend that amount yeah. of, of sales of something that you've done. At the same time, people now want to see you and want to see what you're like, what you're about, and whatever else. Mm. All of these things were so new. It's crazy. You know? So where did the um, genesis of the song come from? I, I mean, you probably spoke about it a million times, but for people <laughs> that never understood where it came from, where, where did the genesis of the track come from? But it, obviously, it came from my When I say obviously, I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> yes, it came from my mum. Yeah. But the actual story of it, how that came about, was I used to do handmade shoes, mate, and um, I used to work in a heel bar. Started out doing handmade shoes, did that for three years, qualified and wow. did all that that's cool. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it was really cool. I did shoes for Paul Newman. I did shoes for the Queen, for Charles. Blimey. Um, That's really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. This was all back in the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're not going to say this is where I got the soul from, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. This was, a, I was um, doing a pair of shoes and the girl came into the um, heel bar. And she was stunning. And I wanted to talk to her. So we started chatting and, and I asked her her age. Mm. And at the time, I would have been 23. She said she was 18. And I thought, Jesus, I can't tell you right age. I'm 23. That's like, <laughs> what, five years? She said, like, no, mate. So she asked me mine. So I said, I'm 20. And I started <laughs> laughing, right? I went home and I was telling my mum the story. <laughs> And she said to me, I've been telling you, you know, you keep rushing to get old. And that was it. <laughs> wow. Right? And she just said, um, I just said to her, like, can you imagine? I'm 23. And I'm telling this girl that I'm 20 just to make sure that we're within the right <laughs> age group. And I'm not looked like if I'm trying to, you know, take a minor or some madness like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And then literally from that one phrase, it all just fell into yeah. place. It all fell it was, into place. Yeah. I keep telling you, you keep rushing to get old. That's amazing. And I was like, that's mad. That's great. And I went back to the Hill Bar and I wrote that song. That song didn't take more than about 10, 15 minutes. I had it all in my head. That's crazy. So are, yeah, are, you, are you a piano player, a guitar player? Did you write it on an instrument or was it just lyrics? No, I put it all in the head and then I, I played... I can play enough to play it to get what I'm trying to say, so construct. But I've always needed um, a proficient piano player who actually knows music yeah. to work with so that the inversions can be different to what my straight thing would be. Yeah. So that's how I pretty much wrote Mama when I got together with Bob. Wow. I showed him where it was. Bob did the inversions, right? And... Uh, the guitar parts, it's, it's a classic song in its sense because it's like we never actually got what we both wanted right. at the end. <laughs> but we got what we both knew was good. <laughs> <laughs> we fought that like cat and dog inside there for that song. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, I think we both actually ended up kind of like, you know, putting arms around one another and hugging one another and stuff, you know. That's cool. It really was a labour of love making that record. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. I mean, it's an amazing song. It's an amazing song. And straight away when it starts, you know exactly what it is. It's just, yeah. it, without be, like, it's the perfect pop song. Without being rude, it's the perfect pop song, Thank isn't you. it? It's, no, I'm, 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 I'm touched by it because it's like it's 40 years on and people still play that song and it's it still... Even to youngsters, it's it, it's got that reaction to it and the energy. Yeah. And you can't you can't have done. We didn't start out ever believing that that this today you and I are sitting down forty years on from today that that would ever happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. I suppose why would you? Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Because you, 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 not, that, yeah. you or anybody, it's like you, you get what I'm saying. You, you don't think that like when you start at forty years on. Yeah, what you started with in terms of a big splash to people still holds a really, really strong place in their heart. And and I'm I'm thankful for that. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I'm, I'm like, 
it's taken me X amount of years to get to here and now to here, and I'm still doing what I'm doing. And people still love that song. I mean, like, you can't not love that song. It's it's brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you. It's no, brilliant. Seriously, thank you. No, it's, it's, it's great. It's that for me. It's like, you know, I, I there's music that I love from 40, 50 years ago, right? And you, when I started out, I said to somebody in America, right, they asked me, what did you want from all of this? Mm. And I said, to be able to just make music that touches people and laughs. Yeah. And he laughed. He, was, uh, he laughed. Yeah, he's a distributor and he laughed. And he said, um, you know, every artist wants that. And I said, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm that every artist. That's what I'd like. If, if that happens to me, then I've done it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, I've done it. I've, I've done, I set out, I, my journey was to set out to touch people with the music that I made. Yeah, not to make music that anybody else was making, but make your own, in your own style, your own way. Take it on, yeah, right. Bold enough to take it on, and that's where I started mentally out on the journey that I was going. Yeah, take it on. Why, why, why do a track without putting in what's English, which is you know a bit of like glam rock. <laughs> Nice. Why not? I come from that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then you get you come back and you look at your bass line. And you're rocking an R and B kind of bass line against the rock kind of thing. Yeah. And that's exciting. It is. Yeah. That's exciting to me. That's still even now, it's still exciting to me. Because <laughs> you're fusing you're fusing styles into trying to make something that's fresh. Yeah. Doesn't that reminds you maybe, right? But it's fresh. Yeah. And you know, to keep the whole thing moving forward. It's amazing. What I found really interesting is the follow up single was too late, wasn't it? And that's a complete contrast to like you I, I always I say pop song, I don't mean saying rude if I say pop song, but you had like a pop no, song. Please. No, 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 no. It is pop they are pop songs. Okay. They were popular. Remember Pop is short for popular. Okay, so fair, they were fair popular play. music. You I know, just, they were popular songs to people. Uh, oh, that's fair play. So uh, you you had a pop song and then you got something like Too Late, which actually had a really serious message in the right. lyrics. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting just to hear them, you know, one minute you're jumping up and down and the second time you're <laughs> jumping up and down, but you're thinking about why you're jumping up and down, if that makes any sense. Yeah. With um with the lyrics to that one, were they semi-autobiographical? Was it just a, a thing you saw? Was it sort of, you know? I... I I was on tour in um, Edinburgh. When I was on tour with Michael McDonald and we were in Edinburgh. Wow. And the Edinburgh Festival was going on. So I had a chance to come out and I was walking and there was another another young lady who was, she came, she was a punk. So she had red hair, green hair and whatever else. I can't remember how we got talking, but we got talking and we was walking around. She was showing me the various stores and various places. Yeah. And we sat down and we were talking and we were talking about, you know, where you come from, where I come from, that kind of thing. And she was telling me her story, which was really about the abuse that her mum had to take during a period of time of their life. Right. And I didn't think, I took it all in, we're in the conversation and you take it all in and then you do your shows and whatever else. And I came back down to London. And I put on the radio and Rick James came on and the first line he had was uh, when I came home that night, right, I was intoxicated. Mm. Word intoxication, right, just set me off. And that's when I wrote Too Late. Wow. Taking her story and the fact of the intoxication of the man and not believing that, like, these people would leave. This, this family would leave. Yeah. And as you said, it wasn't a matter of, it was life and death. It was a serious thing. Mm. Right? So I, that was going on in 1982. So for me, it was to, I'm sponging now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sponging and rinsing out. And what came out was too late. It was something that we needed back then to look at seriously that we weren't even 
bothered with in this country. Yeah. You might hear somebody over there, but then it, people normalized it. It became something like, you know, well, you know, maybe she needed to get it, or maybe you know, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. What are you talking about? And that was 1982. I mean, that's that's a really brave move for a single. Like, you know, that's a really and brave we, move. We, I had to, <laughs> the fight that I had to have with the record company in, in, in England yeah. over the song, because as soon as they heard the lyric and understood what it was, everybody was against that track. Really? Did they really oppose it? Yeah, because it was like, you have come out with Mummy used to say, we need something that's up, up, we need something that's more like that. We don't we, this is too serious. People aren't going to get it. They're not going to understand it. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do what I did before. Yeah. I'm not doing a replica of Mama used to say just to keep the bucks coming in. It's not who I am. Yeah. So we fought. And in the end, I think the power of Mama used to say and the power of the success that I was having, they put it out, but they never did anything in terms of promote it properly, to push it properly. They put it out on the basis of it's a junior single, so all right, right let's see who's going to buy it, that kind of thing. Yeah, I see. Right. But the actual, for me, I was so proud of that record, man. I mean, you should be. So proud of that record because it was, as I said, it was now from what my mum was saying and other mothers most probably said to what I'm now seeing in true life, that I wanted to reflect and say, don't you think that we need to have a, a discussion maybe yeah. or some kind of conversation because this is going on and it's not just going on in London, it's going on in Scotland, Wales. I, it's everywhere yeah. and we're not addressing this problem. And this is 1982, we're now in 2022 and the, the problem has still not been properly addressed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, unfortunately I've never had it in my family, like none of my family's like that, but I do know families right. growing up that, you know, my mates would, would not want to come out and play and all that. And then, you know, her mum, their, their mum had a bruise and, and, and you're like, what happened? Oh, she fell over. Or that. Right. It's like, but she fell over about six weeks ago. You know, all that. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like what's that? When you were a young kid, um, you don't understand that stuff. So, I mean, that record could have literally made people realize it's not normal as well. Exactly. Yeah. Which is what the, the whole thing was to try and push. Yeah. When I, when he came out in America, I used to go around to uh, battered women's homes. Wow. Right? And, and meet some of these people because they understood the song and they would talk about like, you know, thanks for trying to highlight this and thanks for putting it out. And I'm, you know, they would tell you some of the stories that they were going through, right? Not having the confidence to leave, yeah. which is one of the big things within that scenario. And you would, you would, your heart would sink, man. Yeah. You know, because you don't fully, again, all of this learning, you don't really get it until you see it. I'm, I've never been in it. I don't know it. But when seeing it, the effect of it, yeah. Right. The, these people who are terrified. Yeah. And asking for help, and it's not really being given. So, not to get down in this conversation. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very interesting. It's very interesting from your point you know, of view as a songwriter. So, it's very interesting. You know, it was that. It was, I couldn't hear that, know that that's going on, and just walk away and say, oh, right, yeah, that's your life. And, and know that there were people that I knew who were going through exactly the same thing. That's amazing. I mean, anyone listening to the podcast, if you're in that situation, Junior would tell you, get some help. Is get it? help. Get help. Get help. Don't, you know, a lot of the time, I know it's easy for people like me to turn around and say, oh, well, you know, just get out of it. And I know it's not easy, but seek help. Yeah. There are various, various places that you can go to yeah. that you can we will be able to talk to you and just try and help you with your mindset and confidence, you know? Yeah. So yes, I'm still an advocate for that kind of work to continue. Amazing. So 
after a little while, you were working with Phil Lineup for a while, wasn't you? He was working yeah, with yeah. Phil. Um, what was that experience like working with Phil and writing with Phil? Because was there a talk of an album coming out? Maybe was there? Yeah, Phil and I, I, I went out to Coco's one night, and all the pop artists used to go out to Coco's in, in London, and I went to Coco's, and Phil was there, and with his bald Irish accent, came up <laughs> to me and he said to me, "Junior, I want to make a record with you. I want to do something that's like what you're doing with the rock and the pop." And the... so I was like taken aback because I was, you know, I, I love <laughs> being Lizzie, you know, yeah, Jaro and stuff. And you're coming to me, right? <laughs> this is where I said to you, remember this whole bit about the confidence yeah. in writing and not truly 100 having it. So I said, okay, fine, you know. When, how? He said, I'll get in contact, right? So, which he did. Right. So uh, I went down to his place. He lived just near Wimbledon at the time, right? Took me over to watch some tennis as well. James, <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So um, he had a studio at the back of the house and he was on two stick guitar and I'd be singing. And we came up with a song called The Lady Just Loves to Dance. Yeah. And another one called Soldier, about four songs we wrote together. And then we got in um, John Sykes um, from White Snake. Um, who else was there? Um, oh, drama. we got, uh, <coughs> it will come, it will come. But we had an array of these people, right? I don't know how Phil done it, but he got all of these <laughs> great musicians. And we went in with Tony Visconti. Wow. And recorded and we recorded, right? Um, the lady just loves to dance. Yeah. And we took it to the record company and, or should I say the management took it to the record company and they turned around and they said, no, <laughs> right. They're not putting it out. Cause this rock eyes with this soul kid, right. You know, it's not going to work. And it's this, that, I was like, we couldn't believe it. Both of us couldn't believe it. So I think Phil went in because they made a derogatory comment about, you know, colour. Right. And his management told him. So Phil went in and uh, <laughs> gave him a mouthful. I won't tell you what Phil said. <laughs> and he was a big guy too as well, wasn't he? <laughs> he was. <laughs> right. But he went off. Phil went off. And um, they wouldn't put it out. Maybe they put it down to colour and that's, that's when Phil was like what the hell are they on about that's mental and, um, yeah so we, we we did the songs I think they're up on some of them maybe up on YouTube but we did as the uh, the demos yeah what's and, the, what's the matter babies on YouTube huh what's the matter baby that's on YouTube yeah that's on there that's on there yeah yeah, I've seen that one. Up I mean, the, the heartbreaking thing is, I've, I've watched, the, I've like went on YouTube and found as many of the songs as I could, and it was the genesis of a brilliant album. You know, you yeah. could just, and it was the yeah. kind of first rock pop mashup album. Exactly. Yeah, that you would have, that people would have heard. Yeah, because that's what we wanted. You know, when it was like, I want to do something that rock would pop. With what you're doing, that kind of. It was. Yeah. That's what we were doing. We were gonna mash this whole thing up and put it into something that would have been fun. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? And it would have still had the Lizzie elements to it, right, with his bass lines and stuff. But at the same time, it would have had the junior elements and some of the vocal scenarios that I would put in place. So we were, we were you know, Lemmy was part of that stuff. Oh, why? Well. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you start remember Derek Bramble on keyboards, he was part of that as well. Crazy. It was just a, an array of musicians who were just prolific musicians. Well, let's just do something different. It's like a rock soul super group, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and you we... just wanted to do something that was really different to every, as I said, with Mama was the same thing, my whole beginnings again. Yeah. Wanting to do what everybody else is doing. I understand that's what they do, but let's try and do something different. Yeah. And, and mix it with this and come up with something that, like, people are going to say, like, oh, you know, it's, wicked, you know? <laughs> it's just 42 years it's like 40 years too early isn't it it was 40 yeah, years too early basically, so, basically, do you reckon there'll you know, ever, do you reckon there'll ever be a release of it do you reckon it'll ever come out under maybe Finn Lizzie's banner or anything like that Is there talk I think it? sooner or later a lot of the time things like this people will demand it so I think it will oh, I think awesome. somewhere along the line 
right? People are going to get it and like, oh, in a minute. I love it. It is, you know, I, so I'm, I'm a great believer in that and I think it will. It's a great, the demos are great. Really, really great. I'm not saying it because I'm talking to you. They're, they're, you know, people need to go on YouTube and find them. I'm going to grab a listen, yeah. Yeah. They're they were really like firing. Good. We, 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 as I said, it was trying to look for something different, something that's not like Lizzie, not like Julia, mm. not like Lemmy, not like like Smith, not like what Derek Bramble would do. You know, it, it, it was like, we all have our own individual feels to yeah. whatever it is we do. And if we can incorporate those feels together, then it's like a collage of colour. Amazing. And that's what I think we were trying to, to get at. Wow. But as I said, record companies were more into the finance and you've got to look like this. You know, ABC was coming out. You know, a couple of years later, you got your fives, and you get what I'm trying to say. You, you, yeah. you, you can see, <laughs> you right, can see how, how that whole thing kind of like works <laughs> and travels, right? So it's kind of like, whoa, not for me. You know that that it's. But I kind of call that time like period time. Right. So it's like, and, and you're of that period. You're of that time. Five was of that time. E seventeen was of that time. Yeah. Do you get what I'm trying to say? They, yeah. they, they okay, reflect yeah. the time, but they don't move back on yeah. because they, they were part of the industry that that just doesn't truly happen unless you go into acting or something else and then you can come back and make a record and <laughs> maybe people, you know, it's, it's a bit like, who wants to live that kind of life? True. Do you know what I'm like? I don't want to live <laughs> Did you ever do any acting at all? <laughs> Did you ever go down that road? Oh, mate, I tried, I was offered a, when I did my used to say, I was offered a TV program doing a pilot. Oh, right? really? It's a TV program. And um, again, not having that confidence, I was terrible. I, I could <laughs> not remember any of the lines in front of the camera, but as soon as the camera went, I'm on it. <laughs> but as soon as the camera came back, I weren't on it, and I knew and I thought, that ain't for me. This is just not for me. What was right? the show I'm about? Not, Can you remember what it was? I can't even remember. I know it was like some kind of, it was like, I don't even know, it was something to do with space or whatever it was. Oh, right, so, so, <laughs> yeah. So it was that. music related. <laughs> no. It's totally crazy. <laughs> Junior Giscom in space. <laughs> <laughs> I think you made the right choice there, mate. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> no, that ain't for me. I'm not doing that. You know, I'm, I'm never, ever after that, um, other than doing videos, but never, ever after that. That's did any enough. kind of acting or anything. <laughs> no thanks. And then um, a little while later, you, you collaborated with Kim Wild on a, Another Step Closer to You. How was that? Did you enjoy doing the collaboration? Oh, yeah. Kim's, Kim's a mate. Kim's one of the nicest people, right, in the world to wow. me, right? You know, she's just a lovely, lovely individual. And we, again, back in the day, she worked out of Rank Studios. And I went down there to do the hand claps for Mummy used to say because they had a, a toilet down there, had a circular thing. <laughs> And Bob, <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, this is how bad things were. The glamour. And it had a circular thing like in the game. And Bob would clap, right, and we'd hear the sound. And we both were like, oh, mate, if we do that, let's record it here. Yeah. So while we were doing the claps, she comes in, right, and has to come down so we have to stop. So that was our first meeting when Mama used to say to the class. Wow. And then we started talking. And then um, she rang me up and said she wanted to do a duet. Oh, nice. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> so at the time, um, what was his name? Uh, yeah, Michael McDonald and Patty LaBelle had just done On My Own. Wow, that's a great track. Right? Wow. Which is a great track, right? So <clears throat> I've turned and I've said to Kim, I don't want to do any soul track. I mean, you, you this that wouldn't work for us. Yeah. Right? So she's like, what are you after? So I said, I'm after that electro kind of thing that you do, but with more rock. Yeah. So 
She wrote another step, rang me, said, right, I've got the song, right, come down. So I came down and heard the song. We worked on the song. When we finished that song and finished that record, because it was coming out on MCA, which was her label, again, my record company turned around. Oh, I've heard that King Wild Junior track. It's rubbish. You shouldn't put that record out. It's not going to work for you. Like, you know, it doesn't have the right this, that, and Antara. I was like, are you for real? Every time <laughs> I seem to do something and I'm going out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. It's like you're all panicking. It's going to work. They're all panicking. No, it's not going to this. Then the record goes to number six. <laughs> and I'm like roses and champagnes. And we knew you could do it. <laughs> but, oh, mate, we knew you had it going. <laughs> we're doing something. You know, it was one of those things. But that's how Kim and I got together, and and, and we have been friends ever since. You know, we haven't spoken. We spoke the first time um, last week, right? We hadn't spoken to one another in about what thirty years. Wow. But it was like different movements, so you're going that way and I'm going that way, lost touch and whatever else. But it yeah. was like speaking to an old friend, we we, we just chatted for hours. It's amazing. Hours. Amazing. Lovely, lovely. You know, somebody who hasn't changed over that period of time, yeah. the inner spirit and the inner person is still there and it's still just as beautiful as it was back then. And that's him. That's amazing. Is there any, do you reckon one day you might do another single together, like now you're older maybe, to a sort of... Second well, we dress. were talking about that the other day. Oh, right? no way. No way. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that the other day because we've, we've never done uh, another step together live. So that's something that we're going to do together and put that right. And uh, oh. we're going to talk about doing another single. Yeah. That'd be amazing. What a bookend. <laughs> It'd be like a bookend record. That's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. You know, so we... we we missed one another. It was one of those things. It's like, oh, you know. Yeah. But he, he, again, that record's a special record. It's not It's not that kind of, as I said, period movement. It still stands up today. Brilliant, and, yeah. And, you know, that's the beauty, and especially when we were talking about touring and stuff like that. And in her show, she was seeing the song and the reaction that she would get. I've never done it with anybody yeah. because it wouldn't work with anybody for me without her. Amazing. You know? I mean, so it's that. It's, it, it's, I suppose it's just how I am. It's, it's great. I mean, what's interesting about the video as well, for instance, when you do it now is to see like a white lady and a black man that you didn't see that on telly back when you released the single really, did you? That wasn't around. So, Listen, you know, we, we, I wanted to do the, the pictures that came out at the time were black and white. Right. Really hard black and white. So I got on the dark glasses and everything. And everybody was like, why did you choose for that hard black and white? So I said, because it goes against everything that happens in America. Yeah. It's, it's England. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we can do that and make it hard and stuck. Right, and make people think that like, Jesus Christ, look at that black guy, he's really black because it is a black kind of like, <laughs> oh my god, look at that black guy, the glass is nearly as dark as him. And, <laughs> come on, you know what you're trying to achieve, yeah, right? Because you're trying to kill a barrier, you're trying to knock it down by throwing it into people's faces. When we went on TV together, right, we would hold hands and walk on. And I know it used to stir up producers on TV. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. people are so stupid. You get what I'm saying? Because you're looking at it from a completely different perspective. Yeah. And ends than where we're coming from. We went on a show, spoke to the presenter the whole day. And as soon as it came to the actual show, they presented it as Kim Wilde and friend. <laughs> <laughs> you are kidding. That is mental. <laughs> we were cracking up. She and I were cracking up about it. We, we were talking about certain things that went on when we, when we were doing what we were doing. <laughs> and at the time, and she said to me, do you remember that? I'm like, of course I do. But I, she, she turned around and she was like, we're not going on. Yeah. I'm like, what do you mean we're not going on? We're not going on, you. 
I'm like, oh, please, Tim. Yeah. You don't understand. I get this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Can you call the second single Friend and Kim Wilde now? Can you <laughs> flip it around? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That is amazing that even happened. That's crazy. Yeah. That is yeah. crazy. It was, it was classic stuff back then. Classic wow. stuff. And as I said, again, I keep saying that yours and shots and valleys and learning as you're going along, what you're in, perspectives, outlooks, um, expectations, other people's hunger, yeah. other people's drive to keep someone in a position. It's like being a prisoner. You're in, you're in a position and they don't want you to leave. So everything just closes up. <laughs> you know, you're in there, son. That's it. That's the direction. Don't move. Don't look anywhere. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. wow, that ain't for me. I no. couldn't, I, I never wanted, I I did Superstore. Do you remember a program called yeah. Superstore? Saturday Superstore. Yeah. I wrote that with B.A. Robbins. Did I you? Had music for that. Yeah. We oh. wrote that. And, I realized when I was doing that, that like we were taking pictures to show the world, you know, with like, you know, the people involved in it and whatever. And I started standing right behind the piano. It was a piano and you were supposed to stand in front. And I was the other side of the piano and we were clicking and everything. And I was cool. Right. Cool. And B.A. turned and said, Jimmy, we should have a couple of I'm like, oh, mate, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, mate, do I have to? <laughs> I... Really didn't like that side of things after all. Right. I just wanted to, as I said, the music would be able to touch. But so, you know, you won't tell people that you've done this and you won't tell people that you've done that. Why? Just let the music do what it's doing and say what it's saying. And yeah. people document me in, in time to come maybe and understand what I was doing. But not doing too late again. Yeah. I'm not going to do, do you really want my love again? I'm not going to do another step again. Yeah. Right? I want to do better than those. I want to do something else that has that same energy, vibe, and fun and authenticity. Yeah. Right, to, that we started out with. Why would I not want that? Why would I, why would I only want the finance and all the, 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 the materialistic things when the finance and materialistic things never got me anywhere. Yeah. It was the creative yeah. that got me somewhere <laughs> and that didn't even cost nothing. <laughs> is that where um, you were writing for, you wrote songs for Sheena Easton, is that right? Did you? That's is, correct, is, yeah. Is that why you kind of got, Simon as well, yeah. Wow. Is that why you kind of got into that so you could just be free and just write and not worry about? Yeah. Because you, you're not worrying about anything. You're, you're, when Sheila Easton did, um, I did it with a, um, do you remember a drummer called Mel Gaynor? Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. Well, Mel and I wrote that song, and when we gave it to her, and it came back, because Noel Rogers produced it. Wow. When Noel sent it back, I listened to it, and I thought to myself, why is she singing like me? <laughs> why didn't she take it somewhere else? Do you know? <laughs> and then, because I, I, I always looked at it, but like, right, what I'm putting down is what? Is me, right? So yeah. what I'm putting on is how I think the song should melodically move. What I ask for from the artist, right, is that the artist moves it to its own where it feels it. It can we can all sing, but I want to feel you. So if you need to change some of the melodies so that it works for you, mm. right, in a way where you're putting across I am Sheila Eastern, right, then do that. Yeah. Right? But what what happened was you do the demo and the singers would sound like you and you'd get vexed. <laughs> and you'd get vexed. <laughs> and you sounding like what I would do to you. Yeah. Again, you're learning. You know, that like some people, that's what they do. They hear the demo and that's it. To the note of a demo, to that, because that's what the producer also likes. Yeah. So I learned that also when I did Phyllis Hyman, um, I was in a hotel being asked by um, the guy who was producing her um, album if I would, um, Reggie, if I would um, write a song mm. that evening and bring it in so that she could sing it that night. Wow. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
And I just met him in the hallway you know, this hotel. And so I went back, had a little Casio, and uh, messed about with a little Casio and came up with a song, If You Want Me, it was called, right? And uh, went down there, played me little people thing and sang it to him. And he took that and produced it up and put it on the album. And the rest is history. I think we've got gold mm. records for that. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's the, as, you, as you can see, it's the beauty of music that makes me, that, that, that is, is what I love. Yeah. It's, it, that's the love. It, it's being able to do something like what I just said. And then there you go. And 500 thousand albums later you're laughing to yourself because you know that like oh shit that only took six and only took about 15 20 minutes to do it and then we went in and it only took another two hours to do it you begin to understand it you're getting really proficient at this gym you can do this i mean if i got it right you, you've released 10 albums and 29 singles if i've got that right yeah i mean that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> you know and i can't be bothered to get out of bed in the morning <laughs> So, you know, I mean, to say you're not prolific is definitely not true. You know, your catalogue is amazing. <laughs> so, no, I mean, amazing. I mean, it's it's so wonderful that, you you know, even now you're creating and making and writing songs. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't stop. I, I don't want to stop. Yeah. Right? And I get, my, my joy is... Obviously, I'm, I'm a family man because I have a, a huge family. Yeah. But it's watching them grow and them coming back to me and saying, Granddad, did you sing that song Mummy <laughs> used to say? Like, yeah. My friend at school's got it on her TikTok. <laughs> you're, like, you're having a laugh. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that kills me. That, that gives me that kind of oh, mate, you got to get another one on TikTok and give her a laugh and let her have some fun. <laughs> You're not, you, you get what I'm saying? I, I just, I'm doing what I love and I'm so grateful to still be able to do it. That's, That's amazing. True. I mean, keep going, buddy. If people want to find Thank out, you very much. no problem. If people want to find out about you, where's the pl- best place to get information from you? Well, go to uh, juniorgiscom.co.uk. You can get me on Instagram. Um, you can get me juniorgiscom. Um, on Instagram same thing with Facebook you can get me there um, I'm not a great Twitter person no, I really either. don't spend that time on, on Twitter so you can get hold of me there and I'd love to talk to you love to hear from you that's great Junior thank you so much for talking today we had a blast if you enjoyed today's episode make sure to subscribe and leave us a review 